as I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you, I flashed back to when I was a high school student, I first got your first book. And there's a, there's a big section at the beginning of it talking about the talent myth, the idea that people think they're either born with it or they're not. And throughout the years, that's something I've wrestled with a bunch, as I imagine a lot of people learning to play have. What's your kind of current view on nature versus, versus nurture? Like talent exists, but people overestimate it. Like where, where do you fall on that these days? Well, I guess the first thing you need is exposure to something. And then it has to touch you in some way that makes you curious about it. And then depending on how curious you are, you dedicate a certain amount of energy to investigating it. And the more energy you investigate, uh, you dedicate to investigating it, the more progress you make, the more understanding you have. Um, you know, I've been reading this Brad Meldow book, and he talks about uh, he when he discovered he had perfect pitch. But I know a lot of people with perfect pitch that don't play that great. That talent seems to make them a little bit lazy, or they assume that that they can hear everything and know everything automatically. Um, it's a combination of of curiosity and dedication and work and then continuing exposure to better players um, and having opportunities to play with better players. Uh, I think I think the talent is having the good fortune to find something you love and and sticking with it and continuing to love it for a long time. I mean, I've had some some really great students that, um, you know, they're the best kid in their class when they're 10 years old, so they get more opportunities than everyone else. So they play, continue to expand and get gradually even more advanced than everybody else. And then it's time to think about college and, okay, well, what's the thing I do best? Well, I, I play drums, so they go to college. But there have been a few guys that have had revelations at age 21 that they didn't want the fact that they were the best drummer at age 10 to dictate the rest of their lives. Um, so it's, it's that kind of continued passion that's part of it. And some of those guys, you know, have become doctors and lawyers and senators, and they're very successful away from music. So I'm happy that they found that other passion. Um, I guess those are my, my thoughts on it. I don't remember if I ever asked you this, but what did that arc look like for you? Yeah, I was one of the two best kids in my elementary school. Uh, and then through high school, there was always somebody a little better than me. Um, but then he lost interest in my senior year. I became like the, the number one guy. But when I got to North Texas, there were like 150 drum set players there. And I was kind of on the bottom of the pile because I had, you know, very little experience doing the thing that they valued there, which was chart reading and big band playing. Um, so I kind of had to learn, acquire those skills. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was practicing some stuff today that is still kicking my butt um, and looking at new ways of, of twisting things. Uh, not that anyone will ever hear the difference in my playing, but I recognize that there's something I'm curious about that I want to try and get control over, whether anybody else hears it or not. I think that's, that's part of the gift. So it sounds like it was a combination of, of recognizing you had some degree of talent early on, but then maybe you had the experience in high school of not being the best guy. And that's why you arrived in your twenties 
not being equivocal about music because you could have given it up in your 20s and join the football team or become a debater or a doctor or whatever else. But you probably, it sounds like maybe you discovered the love for it then and that just sort of carried through. I think I discovered the love for it, I don't know, maybe age 14 or 15. Um, but the situation was that my father was a businessman and he didn't know any successful musicians. And he knew that if I pursued something that he knew something about, he could make the path a little, a little easier for me. Um, so he was always kind of testing me. Um, supporting me, but also testing my passion. In fact, when I went to college, he insisted that I was a classical percussion major because he had the idea that, that if I was a failed, whoa, a failed classical percussionist, uh, that degree would have more uh, value to IBM than being a failed jazz, having a failed jazz degree. And, you know, we know that that doesn't make any sense, but that was something that that he considered that that degree might might have more more credentials in the straight world. Maybe it did back then. It it feels like it feels like these days. If anything's gonna give you a leg up in the tech industry, it's probably the jazz degree, right? Maybe, maybe, yeah. It's like if you can write code and also play jazz, it's like front of the line. <laughs> well, that's you. <laughs> well, I, I don't code. I don't code. <laughs> I wish. You know, after my after my freshman year at at North Texas, I got a gig playing in an amusement park in Astro World, which was um, a big amusement park in Houston, Texas, and it was with a show band, and it was like an eight or ten piece band, and we played a Broadway review like. A 40 minute show every hour on the hour, that kind of thing. Well, I got fired after the first day because I wasn't uh, really a great reader at that point. I mean, I was a very good snare drum reader, but I wasn't good at interpreting charts and I wasn't good at following a conductor. And getting fired after the first day really disappointed me, but it pissed me off. And I had like a marathon practice session that summer uh, because suddenly I had nothing to do and practicing like eight, 10 hours a day. And when I got back to school in September, people heard a difference in my playing. And I remember somebody asked me, man, what have you been eating this summer? And so the point is that if the hunger is there and you can find the right information, you can kind of transform yourself pretty quickly. This, so I was going to ask you about that very story because I don't remember where I heard it, but it's it's been in the back of my my mind as sort of John Riley lore, and it, it's almost a Rocky esque <laughs> hero's journey. And my personal experience with this is my first year at MSM, I had a mediocre experience with regard to my level, and so then I went home and got super disciplined and, and practiced like three or four hours a day <laughs> and then got back and people heard a difference in my playing. And my second year at MSM, I was a slightly better, still mediocre player. So it, it leads me to wonder, like, what exactly did John practice that summer? <laughs> uh, I had studied with Joe Morello when I was in high school. So I kept really pushing the limits on the things that he showed me, which were bit all technical things. Uh, but technical things that revolved around getting a beautiful sound. Hmm. And I worked on my chart reading. Um, you know, in fact, after my sophomore year there, they hired me to teach there. So it's, uh, y you know, things, things don't necessarily d develop in a, in a straight line. Right. On a particular timetable. It feels like there was a bunch of potential energy there and you have one or two breakthroughs and all of a sudden you could access a bunch of this previous ability that, that had been closed off to you before that. Yeah, I had some, uh, some big gaps that, that um, 
were in areas that were really valued uh, at North Texas. And it's funny, there was a, an educational product that Jim Chapin put out, was a Music Minus One record that was released in two editions. One was just an LP that was minus drums. And the other one was the LP minus drums and a book explaining how you were supposed to approach this stuff. And my father was pretty frugal and he bought only the LP. Um, but I played along with that record like every day from the time I was 12 years old. And I remember the first song on it was called The Lady is a Tramp. And it was kind of like a, I don't know, an eight piece band or something like that. And when I was at North Texas, my, my teacher, his name was John Gates, was trying to help me get my reading together. And he's given me the, these different assignments. And, you know, after three or four weeks, I wasn't making any progress. So he decided he needed to change strategies. So he said, well, this week we're going to play along with something. And so he happened to put on the Jim Chapin version of The Lady is a Tramp and put the chart in front of me. And I knew that thing cold without the chart. And so I played it and, and I guess I played it pretty well. And he said, wow, you've been practicing this week. And there was a kind of a, a revelation in that, in that moment, a connection between the sounds that I knew and the, the way a diagram of them would look on a page. And so that was a real sort of transformative moment where suddenly my reading got much better when I made this association. Yeah, that's awesome. That reminds me of another thing you told me about. Um, maybe after I'd seen one of your Vanguard band gigs, which is that actually for that gig, at the time at least, you were saying you tried to memorize a song as quickly as possible. And I'm, I'm interested if that's still the way you approach it and like how, how you see reading facilitating that. Is it, does it just facilitate getting it into your brain faster and then you get off book with it and you can free associate better? What's that process like? Well, I'm trying to relate to the events that are important uh, kind of on several levels. Like, let's say there's a big accent on beat four in measure seven. So I have a, in my mind, I know what that looks like on the page. And I know physically what it sounds, I know actually what it sounds like. I know physically what it feels like to play. And I know emotionally what it does to the flow of the music. So I'm kind of relating to these events with those four senses. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like to play? And what does it do to the music? Um, and so those, that collection of resources allows me to remember the stuff uh, well. Uh, even if I'm playing a, a tune that I've never played before, um, as, it, as I'm playing it for the first time, I'm sort of these landmarks are are becoming obvious to me and in what which measure the landmark is um so that's that's sort of the process in terms of i mean there's like 300 songs in the vanguard book and i'm i'm reading i'm not reading 95 percent of them and i kind of made an executive decision years ago that I made a discovery that whenever I read the music, I tended to, to approach it in a similar fashion every time. And I was getting bored doing that. So I just decided, well, I'm going to trust that I know this music and uh, I'm not going to pull the chart out. And that was, that was really liberating. And instead of feeling like, um, I have a job to do. It felt more like I was accompanying 16 Sonny Rollinses. And um, that gave me a, a kind of freedom musically that I didn't have when I was looking at the notes. 
Um, and I think it's been better for the band also because there's more uh, variety and I'm trying to keep the thing alive. I don't want it to, to be like a museum band. It's true. We're playing constantly. Everything we do is improvisation. We have the biggest dynamic range at our disposal. <laughs> We're the most able to completely tank a gig if we want. <laughs> we can ruin a gig if we want to. <laughs> but we can also, you know, add a little spice or a little tension in a way that that makes everybody else pay attention and play with, with greater intensity. Who were your biggest influences for big band drumming when you started really going deep on it? And are they the same influences as now? Well, I, I mean, I'd have to say Mel Lewis uh, and Buddy Rich. And there's some interesting records with uh, both Grady Tate and Mickey Roker. Um, uh, Jake Hanna. Ed Sof was a big influence because he was a North Texas guy, a little bit, you know, maybe 10 years older than me. And what I heard in his playing was kind of a modern Roy Haynes ish vibe in a big band approach. And the fact that that there was an Ed Sof, like a kid like me from the suburbs who had a pretty good jazz career, that was inspiring to me. Um, and he played great. Um, there was also a record, Joe Morello made a big band record, I think it's called It's About Time, that, uh, that I listened to in high school. Um, I listened an awful lot to Buddy Rich swing in big band with West Side Story and all of that stuff on there. That, that way of playing informed me, but it was never, it never really infected me, mm -hmm. but he's an absolute monster as well. Yeah. There's these Duke Pearson records with Grady Tate and with Mickey Roker that are really good. Um, there's a, a Hermeto Pasquale record that's basically with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band with Hermeto playing piano and Aerto playing drums. And uh, Aerto sounds amazing in the big band. I remember two tunes in particular. One I think is called Pliers and another one was called Yogurt. And the fills he played were so atypical but so right for the music. It's interesting because when I listen to you with the Vanguard band, I hear a bunch of non-big band influences too. Like, tell me if I'm crazy. I feel like I hear some Steve Gadd. Um, no? Well, that, Steve Gadd was a huge influence. David Garibaldi was a big influence. Um, Mike Clark was a big influence. Those guys were, you know, the hot guys when I was a freshman, sophomore, junior in college. Uh, and they were active then. Um, so, yeah, of course, they influenced me. The groove, the clarity, um, the linearness of, of uh, David and, and Mike Clark. Um, the clarity of Gad's playing, especially, and, and his pulse. But also the thematicism, like it always felt like, and, and I remember this too, when we, we used to shed, like sit opposite each other in the lesson studio and just trade, like um, it, it felt like there was such a development and redevelopment thread like no lick was just regurgitated everything had been like turned on its side and then adapted and orchestrated it it had that that feeling of having been workshopped so that you could sort of just stream of consciousness with these phrases and and the other drummer that i've heard recently that reminds me of that is weckel well i think you could say the same thing about max roach for sure 100 percent I think, you know, Wackel and Max, they did all their improvising at home. 
and discovered phrases they love. And then they found ways to manipulate them and to integrate them in the music it, when they're triggered and they become integrated in a mature way rather than a heady way. Okay, I'm going to play this lick now. Uh, it's always inspired by or triggered by something that preceded it. Um, absolutely, I've, I've practiced that way. Um, I've got a book I could show you with all, like a million little phrases that I'm trying to learn to manipulate. Um, sort of my practice log. And, you know, if I go back to the first page of it, a lot of it, I don't remember how I arrived at that thing that I wrote down there. So each time I look at it, it's sort of rediscovery and some other branch comes out of it. Um, and so I'm looking at that as a sort of a catalog of, let's say, I don't want to say my material, but a catalog of things that I've stumbled upon um, that I'm embracing. How deliberate are you about what you practice these days versus just sitting down and you've got two hours and like see what occurs to you? Well, sometimes I just blow um, and see what what problems I discover. And then that leads to some sort of focused practice on things. But lately, let me grab this book. Lately, I've had these periods of working with this book. He's holding up a copy of Even the Odds, a study of odd meters and rhythms for the drummer by Ralph Humphrey. Ralph Humphrey recently passed away. I think this book came out in the 70s or 80s. And um, the ideas are really nice, but um, I found ways to modify them and to, to fortify them. There's all kinds of pencil marks in there. Um, play this one over this clave. Play this one with this right hand pattern and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, actually, I spent two hours on it last night playing these phrases over a, over a, a seven clave. Um, and it kicked my butt. <laughs> and I like when that happens. I'm I'm pausing because I'm I'm trying to trying to picture the seven clave in my head, and I, I know this is actually something we went over uh, in one of my lessons when I was at MSM. Oh, it's actually fourteen. It's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, mm. two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you play that with your left foot, almost everything feels uncomfortable. On top of that. <laughs> What are you trying to access by doing that? Just like new sort of serendipitous neural connections? Yes. I'm trying to find new things. I'm trying to keep practicing fresh. Um, I'm trying to challenge myself. Uh, and some control, some new kind of control will be an outgrowth of this, whether it has anything to do with seven or not. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, my goals are modest, but also my goal is to stay engaged and growing. I would say that, uh, maybe I told you this before, but when I was about 40, I was on the phone with Jack DeJanet and I mentioned to him that I thought I'd finally figured out how to play. And his response, was, his immediate response made me feel about this big. But when I thought about it, uh, it made me realize why he's Jack DeJanet. So I said, yeah, you know, Jack, I, I feel like I finally figured out how to play. And he said, you know what, man? I feel exactly the same way. And that's what it's all about, to, to have this feeling that you're still discovering things. Yeah. Actually, that that's a really interesting one, and that brings up that brings up something that I wasn't even thinking about, but that that is interesting to me, which is, so now that I'm doing some teaching, I'll have students ask me, 
am I always going to feel inadequate? Am I always going to feel like I'm reaching for something that's ahead of me? Because I hear even great drummers say they're constantly learning. And my answer is usually no. You're going to reach a feeling of equanimity where you feel confident in most situations, but then you'll still be trying to trying to better yourself. Does that accord with your experience? And if so, like, do you remember when you reached that, that point? Oh, I don't know if I can put a finger on when I reached that point, but that does accord with my experience. Um, I think in what, maybe in the art of bop drumming, there's a quote from Mel Lewis where he says, um, even on my west uh, even on my worst day all business is taken care of and so that's that's the point you want to get to i mean i suppose when when i got a call to join woody herman's band um in 1978 uh they sent me all the music beforehand but i had already left my to join them and the music arrived at my house so basically i had to play the gig um there is no rehearsal the first night is the audition um i guess when that when i succeeded there um that made me feel like uh i don't know i had i had enough resources to survive uh in a tense situation yeah and then that gives you the confidence to take on even bigger challenges because if, yeah, if you're not up to the challenge locally, it feels like you've got some confidence in reserve. So you don't, you're not wondering if the drums are wrong for you writ large. Well, I would say even when I was in college and sort of on the bottom of the pile, I followed around the, the number one drummer every day and went to every rehearsal he played and I learned repertoire that way, but I also saw how he act, reacted with other musicians. You know, he became kind of a role model that um, his name was John Bryant. When I was at school, I sort of looked around to see which ensembles got got the most play and which players were the were the busiest ones. And so there was one ensemble that that everybody respected the most. And I made it my mission to become the drummer in that recital, in that ensemble. And um, I thought it doesn't really matter whether I love that music or not, but the skills that I'll gain by becoming competent enough to get that gig, to earn that gig, would be transferable to whatever the next challenge was, mm. would assist me with whatever the next challenge was. So. That's kind of the way I, I look at it. Yeah, I'm practicing this left foot clave in seven. Well, I'm probably never gonna use that, but that might help me with something else in another regard. So yeah, speaking of teaching, I mean, this is, this is something that's endlessly fascinating to me, but I was in your studio at sort of the tail end of the analog era just before YouTube and Instagram became a big thing. And of course, now everything's different. What's the biggest difference you see between your students now and say 20 years ago? Uh, well, people have access to everything. And some of it, some of everything is really high quality and some of everything is not really high quality. But that being said, having access to everything seems to um, encourage people to dabble rather than really study something. I mean, I remember when uh, you mentioned Steve Gadd, I remember when I got that Chick Corea record, The Leprechaun, and Steve Gadd's playing turned me upside down. And I went to the record store almost every day after that, looking for the next record that Steve Gadd was on. And, but I ended up, it ended up being like nine months until there was another record, but I listened to that record every day for nine months. 
I can remember a Ralph Towner record called uh, Batik. I think uh, Jan Christensen was on it. I listened to that every day for months and months. Um, and that sort of immersion seems to be harder to achieve now when everything is available and in front of you and sort of tempting. It's kind of like a box of chocolates, you know, you take one out and you take a little bite and you say, oh, that's a, that's nougat and you put it in and then you take another one. Oh, that's a cherry and you oh, put it back and then you take another one. That's a caramel. And then you take another one and you can't tell what the flavor is. And it's sort of that way with, uh, I mean, people, I have some really good students and I ask them, who's the drummer on Wayne Shorter's Speak No Evil? And they don't know because they don't have the LP in front of them and they're not staring at it while they're listening to the, the record. Some things you can acquire quickly and other things really require time to get deeply. And time seems to be uh, moving faster now so people don't get some important stuff as deeply as they used to when they didn't have all these options. Who are their big influences these days, if it's not Elvin? Well, some great drummers. Marcus Gilmore, Bill Stewart, Ari Honig, Jeff Watts, um, Aaron Spears. Uh, there's so many. Uh, there's a drummer, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name is Nate Smith. <laughs> He's playing really great and influencing people. Um, yeah, there's so many people playing at a high level and they're, they're all getting more exposure than in the old days. Do you find that the conversations about goals are different? I'm trying to think what I was, what I was aimed toward when I was at MSM, but I suppose vaguely I wanted a career like somebody like Greg Hutchinson. Um, I, I imagine now in this fully digital world, people probably aspire to be different things. Have, have you had any, have, have you picked up any, any threads as regards that? Well, you mentioned Greg Hutchinson and Brian Blade. I mean, I could mention so many great musicians who play drums that are influential now. The influence of, of gospel and hip hop has really uh, added another zone that jazz drummers uh, are pursuing. But I guess what I mean is, in your conversations with students about their goals, are they are they still saying, I want to play with the Vanguard Orchestra or the Mingus Band or go on tour with my own group? Or are they saying, I want to be the next Instagram star? Like, has that, has that changed? All of those, but I would I say, and some of them want to be band leaders. I have a few students now that are, that are making their own records. I don't know about the validity of that because the market is so flooded that um, it's going to be hard for it to get noticed, even if it's the greatest stuff. Do you have any strong opinions on career moves for somebody who's just graduating from college in 2023? Well, it's it, maybe it's different than in the old days, but in the old days, you tried to get a gig with somebody who was more established. Uh, that gave you a certain stamp of approval that opened other doors for you. And then maybe after a while, you put your own band together uh, if you have compositions that are worthy. There isn't sort of the apprentice situation that there used to be. Where I remember when I got out of school, you know, big band wise, there was Woody Herman, Stan Kenton, Maynard Ferguson, Buddy Rich. Those were all like the next step for the best college students. Um, and there was Horace Silver's band and Art Blakey's band and Art Farmer had a band. And uh, there were so many small groups that worked a lot. Um, so that that sort of apprenticeship thing isn't isn't there anymore partially because the market changed that sort of circuit of small venues 
has disappeared in a way. Uh, but also the, it seems like either you're a star or you're a struggling musician, this sort of middle class level of musician. I, I don't mean middle class. I know exactly what you mean. Business wise, like Art Blakey and, and Horace Silver, they weren't the stars that Miles and Sonny Rollins were, but they could work all the time. Uh, and that's that part of the business seems to have disappeared. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. So that was an opportunity for, you know, a young Michael Brecker and a young Tom Harrell and and I mean, even a young Branford Marsalis to uh, to get exposure um, and to work for a band leader that said, yeah, that's really good, but I don't want that here. You know, when Art Blakey says, don't play that way, um, you better wake up. But nobody seems to say that anymore. They just uh, replace you. They say, yeah, it sounds great, but you're not on the next gig. Um, so that tough love of the old mentors, I think, uh, unfortunately, has, has disappeared. Yeah, that's a, that's a deep subject uh, all on its own. But I want to stick with teaching for a little bit. What do you think is the biggest thing that's changed about your approach to teaching since I was your student? I haven't given that any thought, but maybe it's more music based than technically based. Um, I think each student arrives with a, a collection of skills and aspirations. And I'm not trying to change anyone to make them play like me or to hold the sticks like me or anything like that. I think my, my purpose is to try and expand the circle of skills that they have so that they intersect with the, the aspirations that they have and to try and make that, that path a little smoother. I think it's always been that way. But there have been focus. At one point, I was more focused on sort of a traditional, we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this. And now um, I'm floating around a little more from week to week, rather than having a sort of prescribed thing. But I will say that every week I go in to teach, I have something in my back pocket to challenge the students if if they don't bring anything to discuss yeah and i i think like i'm i'm very much at the sort of journeyman stage when it comes to teaching because you can have a bunch of conceptual ideas about how to approach something or about how drumming works or jazz drumming works but then there's a whole piece of that interface missing which is how does it land on another human being? Like what happens between your brain and their brain? And it seems to me that a lot of what the great teachers do is decoding how to transmit that information. Maybe sometimes it's not even verbally. Maybe it's by putting them in a context that's going to put them in touch with a feeling that they can then anchor off of. And, oh, this is what it feels like to swing in this instance. And then I can build things off of that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, when I studied with Joe Morello, we almost never played the drum set. It was all on a practice pad and, and we would sit right next to each other and there was a metronome between us and there was a big mirror like three feet in front of us. And I would watch his hands and um, listen to the sound that he was getting and try and emulate that. And I think because I was 16 or 17 years old at the time, I had the patience to then spend three hours every night working on that stuff. I don't see my students having that kind of patience these days. Um, that was really beneficial to me and has allowed me to 
avoid injury um, and sort of maintain my chops all these years later. And um, I've introduced the, uh, that kind of idea, those kinds of movement ideas to some students that I saw that had potential problems and very few of them uh, stick with it long enough to make any kind of change. Unfortunately, it's it's very difficult to get somebody else to want something, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the thing with with Morello was he would give me an assignment and give me a metronome marking to work at it at this tempo, and then he would show me the upward potential of this thing, and it was always mind blowing, um, and so that was the inspiration. Um, for for me as a 16 year old to work on it. I'm not sure it would be as mind blowing for a 25 year old student as it was for me as a as a 16 year old. So that's, you know, that kind of thing has changed a little bit. I was gonna say one thing that kind of brings this full circle and and maybe unites the threads of of tough love and also giving students a, a benchmark to work toward. So obviously I've been thinking a lot about the whiplash thing and s some of the experiences I had while at MSM and then playing in jam sessions and in, in groups around the early 2000s when I think there was still a little bit of that sort of thing. And you're about the third drummer I've talked to who said, we've lost something without the apprenticeship and we've lost something without the tough love. So I've been kind of trying to thread the needle between, I, I don't think that like the, I don't think the whiplash thing is very effective because it just makes people afraid. And then as we were saying, like it's really difficult to motivate people unless they want something themselves. But I think some of the most motivating experiences of my come up as, as a drummer were playing alongside better drummers and getting schooled. So I feel like with you, I had a couple of those experiences analogous to those that you had with Morello. First watching you play the ride cymbal, like that, that imprinted on me mentally. Um, and I still can't do it the way you did, but it definitely motivated me to work very hard on it. Um, and then some of the, some of the times like, uh, we would shed, like just, I'm like, Hey, John, I just want to shed, like trade with me. And I would just see on how much more advanced level you developed your thing. And that, like, without you needing to say anything that like imprinted on me, like, Oh, there are levels to this. Um, and it happened a few years later with Nashit. I took a lesson with Nasheed and traded with him and <laughs> he didn't need to say anything. I was just like, um, happened with Hutch, happened with a few other, other people. But I, I guess maybe I'd voice an optimistic note in that regard where at least to the degree I'm an avatar, I, I think it is possible both to inspire students and also to, to humble them in a way that's, uh, motivating but motivating intrinsically not because you're like scared of a teacher um does that make sense yeah well i've been around uh better musicians that made me aware of all my weaknesses and that wasn't a good feeling and i've been around better musicians that just you know said hey i think you're on the right track and that was much more encouraging for me, much more inspiring for me than somebody beating me down completely. Where you were motivating to me with your words and humbling with your playing, if that makes sense. <laughs> well, and you're still in the game. So that <laughs> trying. <laughs> I remember one time I was talking to pianist Jim McNeely and I asked him, I said, I've got a, a student that doesn't seem to value my opinion. Do you have any advice? And he said, oh man, that's simple. Just play something for them that blows them away. 
and then explain it to them in a way that makes it really clear that they had no idea this component or this dimension was there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can do that and make a student feel like they want to kill themselves afterwards, or you can do that as a way to open a door for them. And, and that's the, the approach I have. I want, I want, uh, there's a Chinese proverb that it's the teacher's responsibility to give the student everything. And it's the student's responsibility to climb on the back of the teacher and take it further. And that's what I want. I want my students to inspire me. And a lot of them have. I mean, you mentioned some of them. Um, they definitely inspire me. But the, the, the common thread is that they found their own voice. Yeah, I was going to say, this has been awesome. Um, really great catching up. Really appreciate you uh, donating your time. Where would you send people uh, to check out what you've got going on right now? Well, Monday nights at the Village Vanguard. I don't like to do this, but I have a fairly new book out that looks like this. I don't know if you've seen it, Nate. He's holding up the Master Drummer Expanded Edition. People seem to, uh, to really like that. Um, there's a couple of, of recordings I made in contexts that people don't think of me in. Uh, some quartet records with a tenor player, Rich Perry. Uh, I feel very fortunate to, to have had so many opportunities to play with people that I admired um, and to continue doing that. Uh, and then to have so many students that were passionate and inspired me um, to find new ways to, to help them move forward. Um, I, ha I have no complaints. Wow, what a, what a great conversation. So many great insights. So really, really dug it. I catch your 80-20 often and, and uh, really appreciate what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate that. Too kind, sir. Too kind. No, it's, well, just being honest. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Nate.